morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Solarize 2020. This is uh, one of our breakout sessions, and whether or not you've come to uh, Solarize before, um, I hope you're enjoying the experience. Of course, uh, those who have been with us before, this is the first time we're all doing it virtually. So I hope you're enjoying the experience and um, in learning more about uh, what Illumin does in terms of uh, partnering and helping men who are on a spiritual journey. My name is Brian Mueller, and uh, I'm your poet guide. Uh, the name of this breakout session is called The Invitation, Writing as a Tool for Healing. So I prepared uh, some, some notes and things to get us started here. So um, again, you know, normally I probably would have tried to find a place outside that was uh, beautiful in nature where I could record this, but you know, I'm not a uh, professional videographer or anything like that, and it's getting to the time of year here where it's cold and uh, rainy. So I think it's best just to find a quiet corner in my office and, and uh, you know, prepare some notes and, and do the best I could with that. So I hope you'll indulge me. But I hope you're watching this wherever you feel comfortable, whether that's uh, indoor somewhere or outside uh, where you have a space and, and the time. Uh, again, my name is Brian Mueller, and I want to let you know that this video session is for all men on a spiritual journey. Today, I hope you focus, uh, that we'll focus on inner transformation and the power of writing and poetry to make this possible. During our time together, I'll share some of my own background and discovery of writing as a tool for healing and spiritual growth. And I hope I can demystify for you the art and practice of writing so that you can connect with that deeper voice within you who speaks with the authority of soul. There's a Zen saying that goes in your heart, you already know. And this rings very true for me. Writing is about calming myself and uh, letting go and hearing what my soul has to say. It's not the voice that's always talking to me in my head. It's a voice that comes from somewhere else, from my heart, from my gut, somewhere deeper, deeper than my head. So let me offer you a little bit of grounding and introduction. Um, one of my favorite exercises, we're not going to do a meditation. Hopefully you've had a chance to do a sit. And if, if not, I always encourage people to sit for 5, 10, 20 minutes, whatever's available to you and whatever feels right. But I always like this exercise that we often do at, at events and retreats uh, that tries to ground us in place. So I want you to think a moment about where you are, and I'll tell you where I'm at. I'm in a city called Centerville. I'm on the south side of uh, the Dayton metro area, Dayton, Ohio, in a county called Montgomery in the southwest part of our state of Ohio in the north central region of a country called the United States, in the middle of a planet called North America, in the nor northern hemisphere of a planet called Earth, which is the third planet from the sun in a galaxy we call the Milky Way. And beyond that, it gets awful big, huh? So again, my name is Brian Mueller, and I just want you to know I've been an active participant in Illumin for six years now. Uh, we do have a chapter in Ohio. We call it uh, Ohio Lumen. It's legally the Ohio chapter of Lumen, but we all just refer to it as Ohio Lumen. And uh, here we feel it is our call to walk with other men on their spiritual journeys. Uh, we sponsor monthly councils in several parts of the states where men can gather and share what's going on in their lives. Those attending our councils can expect drumming, personal check-ins, a meal, and often a program and time for discussion. We also sponsor wanderings. That's time in nature, um, in the natural world where men can get together and uh, go out on their own and then come back to process their experience. We also hold an annual writing retreat, and this is a time for men to gather over a couple days as we move through a program and prompts designed to stimulate uh, thoughtful and creative writing. I lead this retreat uh, along with one of our brothers here in Ohio named Tom Sparrow. This year we'll be offering the retreat again, but we'll be doing it virtually. So if you're interested in learning more about Ohio Lumen, uh, we're at ohioillumen.org. So even if you're not from Ohio, that's absolutely fine. Please feel free to check out our website. And hopefully there's a chapter of Illumin in, uh, in your region. So writing, uh, my journey um, in the invitation, how did I get here? Uh, to lead, help lead men uh, to discover their own inner voice of healing and wisdom through writing. Um, I, I truly believe that uh, everyone is a poet and that poetry is an art that's as old as storytelling. It uh, predates the written word. Um, I'm somebody who uh, did, did well in, in, in studying English and writing and things like that growing up. Um, it's not my, my discipline or my major or anything like that, but I always would write. And I often spent a lot of time writing. Uh, even when I was younger in college, I would try to write some poetry. Um, a lot of times it was just really romantic. 
and it was the kind of rhymy poetry, um, you know, that, that seemed very simple. Maybe it's because I grew up with uh, Dr. Seuss, Cat in a Hat, and just enjoyed rhyme, that sort of thing. Um, at this point in my life, I've had a writing practice for more than six years, and to me what that means is that every morning I uh, make a point of sitting down and usually doing a, a quiet sit, um, also reading the poetry of other people for inspiration. I really love Rumi and Hafiz, but I always mix in other poets. Uh, Wendell Berry is one I particularly like, but uh, I'll pick up some contemporary or take uh, suggestions from other people. And after I'm kind of able to enter a more quiet space, and, and morning does work best for me, um, I pick up a pen and paper and I begin writing poetry. And this practice of writing has really been healing and cathartic for me in my life. I started writing at a particularly tumultuous time, uh, just uh, not 10 years ago yet, but just about um, my marriage ended. And uh, it was a time, it was a really difficult time for me. And I was actually a bit embarrassed about how difficult the experience was and how, how much trouble I was having um, getting through it. And I would wake up frequently in the middle of the night and just, I would feel frustrated. You know, I realized that at that point, uh, my life was not going to go in the direction that I had anticipated and that there was going to be a lot of relearning of how things, um, how my life would go and just my reorienting my complete understanding for what uh, life, life would be uh, and life truly is. And so uh, I, and when I woke up in the middle of the night, there was nothing to do. Sometimes I would read, uh, but then I started writing and I started writing some more and some more and some more. And to be honest with you, um, you know, that early, those early writings were just for me. They're very personal. They weren't something that I would share typically with others. They weren't even necessarily very good or something that easy to follow. It was just a lot of pain uh, coming out, but it was, it was an important exercise for me to start doing that. And then slowly, my writing um, changed. It, it became more informed um, by my soul and by the things that I was seeing, especially in nature. Um, and the new perspectives, I really, through the poetry, I started gaining a whole new perspective on life in the natural world. And during this time, I also began sharing my poetry with other people. And right now I'm getting ready to publish my eighth volume of poetry. I'm just self-published. I don't want you to think that this is a uh, career for me or anything like that. It's a practice. And by sharing my poetry with others, I found, you know, sort of a community and some people that like my poems. And, and actually for a four, four, little more than four years, I actually published a, a daily poem to my email list called Brian's Poem of the Day. A lot of those poems are uh, still available in like a blog on my website at brianspoems.com. And I did that for a long time, and it was, a, it was a really good discipline for me as well. But sharing my poetry has been very rewarding because it, uh, it, helps me, um, it helps me with the practice to really polish and try to articulate what I'm trying to say. When you publish a poem every day, you don't... Um, it's not always great. You know, you don't always hit a home run. And, you know, that's why at some point I've, I decided to stop publishing the poem of the day is to focus a little bit more so that I could spend some more time with the, each of the poems. But it really did force me to think about what I was trying to say in order to share that with others and to make it meaningful. So I think when it comes to writing for people, I think the hardest thing for a lot of us is really just to understand that we all are truly poets that we have that gift inside to write. It's sort of like drawing, you know. Uh, most children are very comfortable drawing uh, until a point comes in their life when somebody says, hey, that doesn't look like a house or that doesn't look like whatever you were trying to draw. And then you start to notice other people around you and you start to compare your drawing or your writing with theirs and you realize, hey, this is not my gift. But I'm here to tell you that's not the case. Um, your gift is for you. If you're writing for any reason that goes... Uh, beyond just personal healing and discovery, um, you know, then you're a professional writer and there's different avenues to pursue that. But I suggest that you start there. I mean, that's a really good place to start and, and to really truly experience your poet uh, within. It was just a couple years ago, I was at a cookout and uh, at that time I was talking to the, um, the wife of one of my high school friends and 
Uh, she said, what have you been up to? And I said, well, I'm just getting ready to publish my uh, sixth volume of poetry. And I said to her, I guess I'm, uh, I guess I'm after six books, I'm, I'm a poet. And she said, yeah, I would say so. <laughs> and I kind of laughed about that. And I thought, yeah, you know, it's good to have some external affirmation that you are a, a poet, you are a writer, you are a creative person, you know. And I'm here to affirm that for you. That person is in you and within you, whatever your experience may have been like in school. Um, this is not English literature, um, you know, of, of the highest order. Um, that's not what we're trying to get at here. We're really trying to find that voice within you uh, that speaks from a deep, deeper place. And I think it'll surprise you when you listen to that voice and then you pull those words out um, from within and you put those down on a page and you read those back. It's a voice, it's a subtle voice that you don't often pay attention to, but there's some great wisdom there and a lot of healing power within them. And finally, let me say, uh, with regard to writing, uh, most of you know Richard Rohr, and perhaps that's why you've uh, first found a Lumen. Um, Richard spoke uh, about his experience in, uh, in male spirituality and men's work at our 2016 Solar Rise. It was called Drawing from a Deep Well. And he pretty much uh, spoke at six or seven sessions that time. And one of the stories he told was how uh, he was surprised in the beginning of when he began offering men's rites of passage that soon after he would start getting poetry from the men who attended the rites of passage. They would send him uh, samples of their poetry and things like that. And he said uh, it really surprised him. He said a lot of poetry wasn't very good. But he said, of course, that's not the point. He said the point was that something had opened inside these men through the experience of their rites of passage or through their own spiritual journey that opened them up to writing poetry and, and what a miracle that was. And I do believe, yeah, that's the case for me. I mean, it's, uh, I never, ever would have thought that this would have been uh, something I do and uh, do regularly as a spiritual practice and even, have even been able to share some with other men in our communities. So I decided to uh, call this little breakout session The Invitation. And I really like that idea. It, the Invitation for me has become a metaphor. Um, I believe, you know, Illumin is, a, is an organization with a lot of doorways. There's doorways into Illumin, and there's doorways for men to pass out through Illumin into other things. And it's a very open community that allows people to come and go, and you can stay. and. I have stayed for a long time and continue, uh, have plans to continue my participation in Lumen. But I think for, for organizations to be truly healthy, they have to have lots of doors. And the doorway to which I entered Lumen came from 12-step work. I've spent uh, even longer a period of my life uh, working in Al-Anon. Al-Anon is a corollary to Alcoholics Anonymous. Al-Anon is for friends and families of our family members of alcoholics and uh, deals a lot with codependent relationships or what people might call co-addiction. And I don't know that I would have come to Illumin had it not been for uh, my experience with 12 steps. But the invitation is something that had come to me through some 12-step uh, work. A few years ago I was invited um, as sort of service work within uh, uh, Al-Anon to go speak uh, to families who, at an addiction center in the downtown of Dayton, Ohio. And uh, I really wasn't sure what I was getting into. And we're in an area of the country where the opiate epidemic hit extremely hard. Of course, there's all kinds of addiction, but I sensed that this center was mainly treating opiate addicts at this point. And they had a requirement that before friends and family members, and this was on a Tuesday night, could come in and visit their relatives, they had to sit through a presentation from 12-step members. And when I started out, there were members of the group Naranon, which is Narcotics Anonymous, for family members of narcotics addicted uh, relatives and friends. And I learned a lot from listening to them, and then I would speak a little bit uh, from the Al-Anon perspective. And over time, I realized that what I was doing was inviting uh, the family members to do their own work because their, their relatives and their friends had come to this treatment center to do the work that they needed to do, but that this was an invitation for them to do some work of their own, whether they realized it or not. And that perhaps was the best gift I could give them. I wasn't necessarily persuading them to come to Al-Anon or do follow the same path that I had found, but I was encouraging them to go a little bit deeper and to uh, 
to begin their own work and that I wanted them to understand that, you know, we're a community of people and that there's this cycle that, w that is kind of revolves in how we work in our relationships and our addictions, both the positives and the negatives. Those sorts of things kind of feed on each other in a cyclical sort of way. So I came to this idea that this was an invitation for them and that they didn't have to f heed this invita invitation, that we all get invitations in our lives. In fact, I, as I think about it, I think, wait, wow, how many invitations did I get before I started to uh, do some spiritual work in my own life, before I showed up at my first Al-Anon meeting, before I passed through that doorway uh, to my men's rites of passage and into a lumen, and how many more invitations have I still received and not paid any attention to? You know, we kind of stuff these invitations in our pockets, and we don't see them, we ignore them, but eventually one of those invitations falls out of our pocket and we pick it up, or it just comes in such a way that we can finally hear it. And that's when we go on a deeper spiritual journey. So that's sort of the basis for the invitation and, and the name of this breakout session. You know, I would, I would eventually, I learned to kind of start off these evenings at the Addiction Center by reading some poetry. And the poem I would always start with was a Rumi poem, and it's called The Sweet Taste of Grief. And I'm going to read it here for you. I saw grief drinking a cup of sorrow and called out, It tastes sweet, does it not? You have caught me, grief answered. You have ruined my business. How can I sell sorrow when you know it's a blessing? I saw grief drinking a cup of sorrow and called out, It tastes sweet, does it not? You have caught me, grief answered, and you have ruined my business. How can I sell sorrow when you know it's a blessing? So, you know, here we are um, at a breakout session about writing and healing. And I want to encourage you to start your own practice of writing. And you don't have to write poetry. And poetry comes in all sorts of forms. Again, there are very strict literary forms that you may have learned about in, in English class. Or you can certainly look up sort of the formats of Eng English, Italian sonnets, those sorts of things. And it gets even more complex than that. And many of us have tried uh, to write, read Shakespeare. Some of us perhaps uh, enjoy it more than others. Or find those of us, I'm one of those that find Shakespeare in the original language to be very challenging. Though I do like the uh, stories that he tells. But I want to, you know, again, demystify this poetry. You do not have to write in poetry, but it does not have to rhyme. You know, poetry kind of has a rhythm. It has a feeling. I still today sometimes write things that I, I think are maybe a poem, but they aren't. They're sort of a prose stream of consciousness, and that's fine. If you'd like to journal as part of this exercise, that's absolutely fine. Maybe that's how your soul speaks to you in a more narrative type of format. Uh, and also, poetry doesn't have to start with anything big. I write in poetry because I tend to get bogged down in details if I try to write prose. I, would lo I love the idea of writing something long form, a real story. But I find myself getting so lost in details that the narrative never moves. And that's why I like poetry. And I usually try to keep my poems no longer than a page. Sometimes even shorter ones are great. Everybody, maybe by now, is familiar with the uh, form of haiku. Haiku is five syllables on one line, seven syllables on the second line, and five syllables again on the third line. It's a very narrow format, but through practicing it, you can really say a lot in, in just those, what is it, uh, 17 syllables. So that's a Japanese form, five, seven, five. And there's, some, uh, there's a, a form called tanka, and I don't remember the, the, the pattern, but it's a little bit of an extended form of the haiku. So when you get ready... To actually do some writing today. I don't want you to feel hemmed in uh, by the limitations of what you think a poem should be or what you think writing should be. I just want you to write. I think that's a real important thing. And learn how your soul speaks to you. And it's real important too to see that and to, and to read those words back and find out what your soul is saying. So I wrote this poem um, on September 18th, so just a couple weeks ago. And I wanted to share it here today. It's not extremely polished or anything, but hopefully it'll continue to bring us into a more sacred space. Welcome, brothers. You come here today from places near and far to gather with other men and to drink from sacred waters on your journey of illumination. What brought you here to this beautiful wellspring wasn't a path of ascent along a gilded road of glory. 
No, you came here cracked and as broken as the path, now winding its way downward, all the way to that tiny patch of ground where you've discovered your true self right next to those sacred waters. Look around you, though you may not see their faces, there are others who have come to join you. Drink and delight in these healing waters. Take as much as your wineskin will hold. Then continue your journey humbly, leading others as you have been led. All right here, let's get down to uh, brass tacks here. Let's get down to business. Uh, usually writing works better for men, for anybody, uh, if you have a prompt. It's one of the reasons that I try to find a quiet space and, and move into a quieter space in the morning before I begin writing. Morning's good for me too because sometimes there's remnants of dreams left over that help stimulate my writing. But this is also why I read other poets, because reading their words can act as sort of a prompt for me. In this case, uh, I'm choosing a video that I'm going to drop in here um, in this video. It's, it's Cornell West speaking on uh, Martin Luther King Day in 2017. So this, this video is from January 2017. It's from a talk he gave at uh, Valparaiso University. And let's see here. This, this video is really... I hope a gut punch for you. Um, I, I think it may push your buttons some. You know, I want it to push your buttons. I, I don't uh, want it to do this. I don't want it to prod you or provoke you in unhealthy ways, but I'm an instinctual type and I really like sometimes getting a gut punch because it's something that I can feel viscerally. And if I can feel it viscerally, I often pay attention to it much more so than something coming uh, straight at my head. You know, uh, it's not the best way to get through to people, I don't think, always. Let's get them in the heart. Let's get them in the gut. So pay attention. But, you know, just watch this video from wherever you come from and just and just let the words wash over you. Cornell West is a gifted speaker, and he's a wise man, and he's been on a journey of his own and has a lot to share. So you may find him at first to be a little bit critical of others, but pay attention to the way he criticizes himself. Self. And pay attention, uh, observe his words, uh, and hopefully you'll find some encouragement within them. So without further ado, I'm going to drop in the video here. Um, afterwards, I'll be back. And uh, just to let you know, I'm going to provide notes to go with this breakout session so that you can you know, follow this at your own pace anytime. But you can always slow things down to push pause, stop, take notes, whatever. But you don't. There's not going to be a quiz. So we'll come back and I'll offer you some prompts to continue on. Given our market-driven culture, what is it that holds us together other than an allegiance to the Constitution, Declaration of Independence? What is it that holds us together other than an idea of America itself so that you end up oftentimes waving the flag and losing sight of the challenge of the cross to that flag because that flag itself can become another idol if it's not wedded to truth and love and justice. Got a challenge these days with my dear brother Donald Trump. Pray for that brother every day. Oh, brother, brother West, God is not in the business of responding to your prayers. You praying for him? No, no, that's, I'm not, that's not the kind of human being I am. I don't believe anybody is beyond redemption. Why? Because I was a gangster before I met Jesus, and now I'm a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivity. Oh, yes. So when I call somebody else a gangster, I'm not just calling the name. It's inside of me. And I have to fight it every day. Come to terms with it all the time. Donald Trump does in many ways represent, in my own hum humble opinion, so much of the worst of what the nation's about. But I got the worst in me. So he's on a human continuum. And the question becomes, can we manifest the best in America in light of the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. so that we get more and more thousands and millions of folk who straighten their backs up and say, in the name of the best of America, we affirm our quest for truth, fallible quest that it is, 
that allows suffering to be heard beginning with the least of these from the prisons, from the hoods with the decrepit school systems and massive unemployment and underemployment with the indecent housing that too often is manifest across the board. Who will raise their voice in that way and then bring pressure to bear and say, now, Brother Trump, what you going to do and what you got to say? Yes, we're going to bring some pressure. Yes, it's going to be nonviolent. Yes, it's going to be principled. It's going to be shot through with integrity and honesty and decency and courage. But like Martin Luther King Jr., he didn't die for nothing. This legacy must be manifest, and it must especially be manifest among the younger brothers and sisters. That's what I love in the last six months. My God, if the only American citizens could vote if we were under 30, we'd have a different occupant of the White House, wouldn't we? We'd probably have a Jewish brother named Bertie Sanders, but that's another lecture. That's another lecture. Oh, that's another lecture. I'm going to get into that one. Though. That's what the polls say, but you can't trust the polls these days. You know that. Martin Luther King Jr. looking at America in 2017 sheds thick tears. He weeps and he weeps because 22% of America's children of all colors live in poverty in the richest nation in the history of the world. That's a moral disgrace that's spiritually profane. That 45% of children of color under six years old live in poverty in the richest nation of the history of the world. That's a moral disgrace. It's spiritually profane. Did we hear any discussion about it in the presidential campaign? Not at all. That's called evasion, avoidance. That's called being obsessed with the big monies coming your direction rather than the plight of God's precious children who are often overlooked, usually overlooked. Martin Luther King Jr. looks at America today and he sees stagnating wages for 40 years, but sees profits at the top. When I was the age of brother Joseph and sister, student president, student body president, 1% of the population owned 21% of the wealth today, 1% of the population owned 42% of the wealth. Just report last night, Eight human beings have wealth equivalent to one half of all of humanity. Eight human beings have wealth equivalent to 3.6 billion. Well, Brother West, you know they're very smart and uh, they, uh, they work very hard, so therefore we got a meritocratic criteria. No, no. Well, I was born at night, but not last night. <laughs> no, don't trot out that argument. No, those 3.6 billion in Asia, in Africa, they have exactly the same status and significance as any other human being of any color. That's the legacy of Martin King and Dorothy Day and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel and Philip Berrigan, Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker, and so many others who are cutting against the grain but how do you cut against the grain these days? That's the question. 1968, Martin's gone. I was 14 years old. Never forget it. It changed my life. I always wanted to be a track star or the next Willie Mays. But when they shot Martin down, I said, there is no way that I can go in that direction. I choose the way of the cross, to tell the truth, to not be popular, but try to have some integrity, to refuse to be well adjusted to injustice, just to be a po polished professional, but rather to be mal adjusted to injustice and to be a love warrior and to use whatever professional skills I'm able to accrue in order to try to keep a legacy alive among the younger generation because the younger generation for the most part 
all they know is a market-driven culture. All they know is getting over by any means. All they know more and more is the obsession with the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught. There is no Martin Luther King Jr. without a Mahalia Jackson. It's like there's no generation of black people in my time without an Aretha Franklin. Our precious young folk got Beyonce. I love Beyonce, but that's not progress. Martin Luther King Jr. was very suspicious about a culture of superficial spectacle. You got to look a certain way. You got to show a certain way. You got to make sure that you are projected as image. And all Aretha needs is just a microphone and a piano. And Mahalia didn't even need a, a, a piano sometimes. She just stepped up to the microphone and she touched every nook and cranny of your soul, the dark precincts of your heart because she was offering up her big heart to empower your heart. She wasn't offering an image to stimulate your body. Where are the Curtis Mayfields of the younger generation? Where are the Bruce Springsteen's of the younger generation? It's not that the younger generation doesn't have the creativity and imagination and intelligence. It's that they are told to be smart. And I say, no, let the phones be smart. You got to be wise. Let the phones be smart. You got to be loving. Let the phones be smart. You got to be courageous. Martin Luther King Jr. came up in a time in which there were singing groups that were tender and sweet. He loved a genius from Georgia named Otis Retton who said, try a little tenderness. He didn't say, say my name, say my name, say my name. <laughs> There's a spirituality here that's crucial because there will never, ever be a tradition that flows out of the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. without rich spirituality that's then tied to social activism, that's tied to formation of character and personality, that's then tied to politics, that's tied to existential formation and learning how to die, that's then tied to economic quests. They go hand in Hand, and there's no better place to wrestle with this than this institution that still has the audacity to be related to the Christian tradition. And I speak as a Christian. I feel at home here. And yet we know that Christians have no monopoly on goodness, on beauty on holiness based on the practices of Christians of all colors in 2,000 years. That's why we learn from our Islamic brothers and sisters. We learn from our Jewish brothers and sisters. That's why we read secular figures like Bertrand Russell or remain in conversation with pagans like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. They're part of the larger conversation to do what? to try to bring together what Martin Luther King Jr. brought together, which is the weave, the virtues of truth questing with love witnessing. Last but not least, we talk about America, we usually talk about optimism. We saw the optimism of our dearly beloved brother Barack Obama the other day in Chicago. And he is such an optimistic brother. He's, he's brilliant and charismatic. I've had my critiques, but I won't go into that now. But he's brilliant and charismatic, but he's optimistic. And a lot of people love him for that. But Martin Luther King Jr. was not an optimist. He was a prisoner of hope and never confused optimism with hope. Optimism was about the evidence and whether the evidence allows you to infer that things are going to get better so that things are just on the up and up. We always on the way to a perfect union. And I can hear Martin Luther King Jr. saying, that's not true. 1865, the slave was freed. Here come the 1880s and 90s back into slavery called Jim Crow Senior. 
There is nothing called automatic quest, automatic progress toward a perfect union. It's based on the choices that every generation makes. I remember when I first heard Brother Barack Obama, he said, America's a magical place. I said, this brother's going to have a Christopher Columbus experience. He's going to discover America. Ain't nothing magical about America. America is free and democratic to the degree to which every generation decides to keep it free and democratic. America can go fascist, tyrannical like any other society if the generation is unable to muster the courage to think critically, organize, mobilize, preserve public life, and make sure that all of us can enter that public space with respect. Never been on automatic, never will, never will. Just ask our indigenous brothers and sisters, they don't have to be in the room. I'm glad you mentioned Standing Rock. They don't have to be in the room to give us a view of America. For us to be sensitive to their suffering, this was their land. Their babies violated, mothers raped. They give us a conception of America that yes, we must learn from, bring them in like fellow human beings, loving them like anybody else, but never confuse optimism on the up and up with hope. Hope is something deeper. Hope means you choose to be a certain kind of human being no matter what the circumstances are. Things look good. You still have the same commitment to integrity, honesty, decency, and courage. Things look dark. You still got the same commitment. That's why in these Trump years, people say, oh, Brother West, I can't take it. Trump's president. I'm suicidal. I say, turn on some John Coltrane. Get yourself together. I come from a people that know wounds and bruises and scars and contempt, massive exploitation and oppression. You got to be ready. You got to be fortified. Are you willing to pursue the truth in your fallible way? Are you willing to organize? Doesn't mean you got to win. You're going to go down swinging. It don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. That's Duke Ellington. That's what we're talking about. Prisoner of hope. And that's why we come to remember Mark. Not because we uncritically defer, but because we lovingly and critically accent his grand example among others because he's part of a wave in an ocean of a tradition. He's part of a movement of all colors and genders and sexual orientations. He made the movement and the movement made him. What kind of movement will we make? That's our challenge. Thank you all so very much. All right, welcome back. I hope you really like that video. I've shown that uh, a few times at uh, writing retreats and, and to, uh, at other men's gatherings. And by and large, I, I get a very positive response. I think the, that video really wakes men up and, and, and inflames some of their passions. I think in it, you'll find you know, themes of masculinity I really like the way he uses the words, um, he's a reformed gangster. And he doesn't differentiate himself so much from other men, specifically in this case, President Trump. He sees himself on a human continuum with all other men and women. Um, he does talk about white privilege and the ongoing struggle, not just for civil rights, but for human rights. And he un illustrates the struggle is not top to bottom. It's not black or white or from many colored, any color, it's, it, or left or right. It's top to bottom. And he offers us uh, the perspective that interchange allows us to see things more clearly, like our connection to this planet. And he seems to suggest that healing comes through serving and helping others and truly finding that connection. So... There's just so much in this video that I like, and I'm going to ask you to respond to that in some of these prompts. So my suggestion to you is if you have some time right now to begin writing, that's terrific. Let's start with the prompt from the very first prompt. But I'm going to offer you, I think I have five prompts here from the video. And there's more. You might find even more to write about in the video. But maybe take these prompts one day at a time. You don't have to do this all at once. Certainly, there's going to be some recency in your mind if you've just seen the video and that you can complete these a little sooner. But I don't try to write, even though I write on a daily basis, which kind of adds up to a quantity of writings, I don't think it's necessarily beneficial to just write, 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 write. Create some space in between the writings. And again, 
this will be included in, in a handout that you can download. Day one, how, this is the first prompt, how are you or have you been a gangster? Again, that harkens his, uh, his uh, Cornell West language, that he's a reformed gangster. Prompt number two, Christian or not, you no doubt understand Cornell's metaphors. So how have you chosen the way of the cross? So Christian or not, whether or not you consider yourself a Christian, you no doubt understand the metaphors being used in this video because you probably are English speaking and live in the United States or other country where Christianity is prevalent. I want to know how have you chosen the way of the cross? Write this, write to that topic. Number three, how can you cut against the grain, again using Cornell's words, and go your own way? How are you refusing to be well adjusted to injustice? He says we need to be well, he says we become well adjusted to injustice and we need to refuse that. We need to push back. How can you cut against the grain and go your own way? How are you refusing to be well adjusted to injustice? Prompt number four. What part of this video or what language spoken by Cor Cornell West spoke most deeply to you? What part of this video, the video is about 15 minutes, what language spoken by Cornell West spoke most deeply to you? And number five, how is spirituality crucial, indispensable, or healing in your life? So this is kind of wrap it all up. How is spirituality crucial, indispensable, and healing in your own life? So again, I'll have a printout here or something that you can download uh, that you can take away from this. I'll include all my notes. Uh, I'm going to offer you last here some writing tips before I wish you well. Um, get comfortable. You know, find a place where you can come back to on a regular basis. Maybe it's a, a table in your house, a chair. I'm sitting in a nondescript corner of my office in an easy chair that, that I like to spend time with in the morning. Um, often my dog is in here, Simon, he sits with me and he snoozes while I, I do my writing. Uh, something that I've, I've heard from other men before and I've, I've told other men and, and they've said it's been really positive is get that first line down on the paper. Everything kind of hinges on the first line. If you've heard some really well-known poets and David White comes to mind, it's really that first line often that draws you in and, and really is going to inform the rest of your poem or your writing. And this even is true for journal writing, but David White will actually repeat that first line several times, or the first couple lines. But those first lines kind of, for me, always kind of inform what I'm thinking about or what my soul wants to talk about, and then the rest flows from there. It does get easier after that first line. Again, forget about what you learned about poetry in school. Remember, we're all in poets. Uh, we're all poets. And this is a practice. Uh, you will get better if you practice on a regular basis. It's just like anything in life, you know, repetition improves um, your writing. So, you know, do it. it, it and it, I think you'll find it's something that becomes easier for you at times. And then maybe, again, it'll be get, get a little bit more difficult. You know, I don't know. It's just one of those things. Um, but a lot of goodness comes out of this writing, a lot of useful information. You'll be surprised at how much you weren't really aware was going on just beneath your con a conscious level in you, within you. And you wonder, how did my soul get so wise? I, you know, I think a lot of it, who knows? Maybe a lot of it's experience, but maybe it's something that you're carrying from, you know, collective wisdom or something deeper that has run through our human history. Uh, feel free to share your poems. You can, uh, you can send them to me. My email is brian at brianspoem.com. Or you can share them with the other men in your circles and things like that. You know, sharing, what I've learned through sharing my poems is to have a little bit of a thicker skin. But also, too, you'll be surprised at what comes back to you. A lot of people will respond to your writings in ways. They'll be able to affirm things because it touches them in a similarly deep way as it has touched you. And although there are some people that will tell you bluntly, not very good, not really enjoying this, um, or... They won't say anything at all. That's probably the most predominant reaction you'll get from a lot of people with whom you share poetry is no response. That's fine. I mean, that's just part of the experience. But sharing is important. I mean, again, I think poetry is an art that's related to storytelling, and it, it predates uh, written, written uh, words. So 
uh, don't have any illusions. You know, this poetry is for you and it's going to reveal some of what's going on in your shadow. And shadow is another big topic, you know, but shadow is that part of us that we don't see or we don't want to acknowledge. And it doesn't necessarily, it's not all negative. I think what you'll find in your shadow is a great deal of beautiful beauty as well. But it's things that uh, you may not have wanted to acknowledge or not even known about yourself. So I hope that you'll find in your words uh, some some glimpses of what's what's lurking in the shadow, that, that big bag uh, of experiences that you carry behind you. So that's all I have. Again, my name is Brian Mueller. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, you can uh, go to my website, brianspoem.com. I'm uh, very involved in Illumin and, and Ohio Illum chapter of Illumin. And I hope that you've really enjoyed your experience at this Solarize and have uh, explored a lot of these different sessions. And I know we're going to make these available even after Solarize on our YouTube channel. So uh, feel free to share this practice with uh, other people in your life. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.